Hello, I'm Smitha Tharoor and welcome to Stories of Unconscious Bias, a podcast where I ask guests from around the world to share their story and to reflect on their life experiences with unconscious bias. I hope you enjoy listening. They were recorded globally under COVID-19 lockdown conditions. I would like to introduce Nina Pandari. Nina has been a career journalist for over three decades. She has worked in India, the UK and Australia, writing on a range of issues from health and science to environment and development, gender and human rights to travel and indigenous issues. Nina is also a very dear and valued friend, so I'm thrilled that Nina has agreed to have this conversation on stories of unconscious bias with me. Nina is currently in Sydney, while I am in lockdown Delhi. Welcome, Nina. Uh, Hello from sunny Sydney, Smita. So, Nina, unconscious bias. What do you understand by those words, unconscious bias? I had actually not thought of unconscious bias until you mentioned the term and explained the work you were doing on it. To me, the term itself, in a way, seems biased. I would rather call it unconscious assumptions, which are based on certain preconceptions we may have about a person or a group of persons or an object or a place. And that preconceived notion does not always stem from a bias, but more often than not, it is biased on a general perception. It is based on a general perception, sorry. It is how we perceive or think of a person or a group of persons based on what is mainstream or the norm. That's really interesting, Nina, because there are a couple of things here that I want to react to. One is possibly your unconscious bias about the meaning of the word bias, because all bias is is a preference. Um, But we, not just you and I, but the world over, when we use the word bias, we usually use it in a negative connotation. Uh, So, of course, uh, a bias is a preference or an assumption, and I completely agree with you on the point that you've made. Um, What kind of example can you give on that? So, for example, I have poliomyelitis in one of my lower limbs, and in school, my peers and teachers assume that I cannot play games or participate in the marching band, And I would be more inclined to do needlework or play Scrabble or play the guitar in the school orchestra. So it is an assumption they made based on what they thought a polio survivor could or could not do. I never felt it was based on a bias or a prejudice as I did play basketball and marched playing the flute and at one time about eight kilometers through the streets of Ajmer in Rajasthan, India. So in hindsight, when I think maybe my peers and teachers didn't want to hurt me by pushing me to do something they had assumed I wouldn't be able to do. But then that assumption would have excluded me from the game and the band had I not persevered and proved them otherwise. That's brilliant. And it just it makes me realize that there are so many Uh, assumptions that we have about human beings Um, and we often uh, do it just to protect them certainly at the moment I am uh, in I usually live in London but I'm in Delhi at the moment during due to COVID-19 and I know certainly in India uh, people treat the elderly in a particular way and I say that the elderly become old because they've given so much care whereas the, the elderly in, in other countries, say like London, for example, uh, are still getting on a bus and, and being independent and so on. So similarly, because you grew up in India and you were in Rajasthan in school, uh, people were looking at you and making assumptions that they must protect you. And therefore, they oh, surely you can't play basketball. Surely you can't. That's, that's a brilliant, brilliant example. And certainly listeners um, who are listening in will all uh, understand where you're coming from, because especially those of us who may have any kind of uh, uh, physical disability, you know, and still survive and do what exactly how they want to do and manage their lives exactly up their own terms rather than their teacher's terms. That's that's very good. But why do you think that despite the teachers trying to support you and cocoon you from basketball or, you know, marching in a band, 
Why do you think you chose to do that? What's that about? So I grew up in a family where I was not treated any differently because of my physical inability or disability, whatever you may call it. And I was treated like my other two sisters. I was made to do everything else that they did, whether it was dancing, playing, walking, climbing mountains, um, whatever it was. So I never felt anything different. But when I decided to pursue journalism, which was a very physically demanding job in the late 1980s, uh, my editor did hire me as a sub-editor. And maybe because he thought with my physical disability, I would be more suited for a desk job. But then again, I endeavored to do reports from remote areas on my own. And it took a while to get that break of moving from the desk to becoming a correspondent. And if not a journalist, I would have been a lawyer because I have a law degree. But in a way, I'm really glad that I chose journalism because it's a profession which gives you the opportunity to travel, to meet, to know, and to learn from a cross-section of society from across the world. And you learn to appreciate and empathize, not just humans, but every aspect of life on Earth. It's very objective, but at the same time, very spiritual. And I think that equips you to deal with, as you put it, the unconscious bias. That's fascinating, uh, Nina, because I, I want, to, want to know a little bit more. I think we, all of us, the listeners and I, want to little, want to little, know a little bit more. So I'm going to put it bluntly. So here you are, uh, 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 a woman who clearly has, uh, my words, not yours, a dodgy leg because you're wearing a caliper. So anyone who looks at you will see that you, ha you are not physically as abled as them. You then make the decision to go into areas that a lot of people may choose not to go into, tribal areas, um, things that require a lot of physical audience to, to, to get there. Uh, you meet and you communicate, you do stories, you interview, you do all the things that a journalist does. Tell us a little bit more about that and perhaps a story that you can think of, any kind of experience that you've had where you've been somewhere and, and you've taken something away from there in your own understanding or experience? So I, after leaving India, I've been living and working in the UK and Australia. And while working in this part of the world, I've also traveled to a lot of Southeast Asian countries, been to the US. And I find that your accent and diction is a giveaway of your ethnicity. So I remember once wanting to interview a famous writer based in London who was coming to Sydney on a speaking tour of Australia. So when I called the publicist to request an interview, she just put the phone down saying they only dealt with English press. And I was then working for the Press Trust of India. So I called back to ask if English meant English language or British media. And she just slammed the phone. So I guess she assumed that PTI would be some Indian language news agency. However, I did manage to do the interview while the writer was in a lounge at Heathrow Airport waiting to board his flight through the publicist in London. So I guess because probably there are, there's a large presence of Indian media in London, she understood what PTI stood for. And there's another occasion where I was at an international conference and had a very interesting conversation with one of the speakers who had walked up to our table. But when I met him outside at the end of the conference, there was shock and disbelief on his face when he saw me walking with a caliper because he had no idea that I had a disability when he was sitting next to me on the table and talking to me. So perhaps he didn't imagine I could have a physical disability or I don't know if he had an unconscious bias. So there have been other instances when at a media dinner during the 2000 Sydney Olympics, an official asked me, how did I send my stories to India? And very matter of fact, I said by email. So he turned around to the person next to him and he said, aren't Indians clever that they have a Sanskrit software? And in my mind, I was just only hoping that this, he wasn't serious about what he had just said. Because having had a disability, I'm very conscious of not patronizing and showing sympathy, but respecting the person 
for what he or she or they are and similarly like there's another instance i would like to share um i was asked by a border security officer in la after i had cleared the customs how did you go to australia and i thought it was a very strange question to ask so i was very tempted to say by boat so not sure if he had an unconscious bias that south asians probably go to australia as asylum seekers on a boat and interestingly he was an african american i i i i'm listening to your stories and uh if you can only see my face uh there's somewhere i'm actually trying not to laugh out loud uh, some <laughs> i've got my eyebrows raised thinking i mean can this be for real um but it, it these are these are so many different stories all telling the same thing let's just let's just recap and remind ourselves the most recent story of course was an african american wondering how you get to australia and and maybe we don't know this for a fact it could be your un- unconscious bias maybe assuming mm. that that uh, you could be a refugee in australia um in 2000 as recently as 20 years ago which an internet has been around for a long time um somebody in, in during the olympic ceremony is asking you assuming that you write in sanskrit um, and surely people in india can only write in sanskrit um but what you know these stories that they, they have there's a similar theme isn't there between all of these stories what is that theme in your understanding i think it's again it comes from perception people have because like the moment they hear me talk or they see me then immediately assume i'm from one of the south asian countries i'm indian basically so then in their mind i think they form a certain opinion or they have a certain belief about that country and they react to you based on what they know they think they know about that country or the people of that country and it doesn't matter whether you, like i am an australian citizen or if i've lived here now for 20 years but there's something which stays with you and in your interactions with people wherever you are hmm uh because the, the accent i thought was a very interesting one that you brought up uh, and i mean yes you've given us one example but i bet you have many more examples than that and the fact that that when we hear you and of course when they hear me too the listeners they will know that we are both of indian origin uh but we have both lived abroad for a very long time away from the country of our birth and where we grew up so what is it about accent what kind of experiences in sydney australia now you've been there for 20 years in your interactions uh in in australia itself how do people react to accent because just as an example um certainly living in london the australian accent is is not considered a very um sweet <laughs> voice accent to hear let's put it that way but that's mm-hmm. the, the british unconscious bias perhaps towards the accent that emanates from australia but what mm-hmm. kind of stories have you got about accents whether yours or anybody else's so australia is again a country of migrants we have the largest number of migrants i think second only to canada probably in the world so um i mean we have people from almost every country around the world and our accents like south asian accent uh, similarly there are people from latin america from africa so they all have uh, different accents so in everyday life accents don't really matter sometimes you have to say a thing maybe twice to make somebody understand um but otherwise i mean it's not something which is looked down upon or it is any different but um I'm not sure how else to put it. <laughs> no, that's that's totally fine. Um that's totally fine, but I I want to ask you something else uh, Nina because I must. You're a journalist and you have had so many interesting stories and experiences including uh, as I mentioned in my introduction working with indigenous people. You're an Australian mm-hmm. citizen, you live in Australia. um many of us uh, will know the history of Australia in terms of indigenous people and and where we are now i wonder whether you can tell us a little bit more about your stories 
uh, with them uh, uh, under the framework of unconscious bias and what you might have learned from that? Well, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are still amongst the most marginalised populations in the developed world. I've been very fortunate to have had this opportunity to travel and write from some of the remotest Aboriginal towns. But when I first started going to these towns, many of my friends and acquaintances asked if I felt safe going there. It did make me cautious because Aboriginal people are significantly overrepresented in the criminal justice system. They comprise 28% of Australia's adult prison population, even though they are only 3.3% of the Australian population. And many of these communities are rife with problems of petrol sniffing, high alcohol consumption, and domestic and family violence. They live in abysmal conditions, and the Australian Constitution still does not recognize Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as the nation's first peoples. I feel because of the racist subjugation that they have faced, initially it takes a while to break the ice when I interview them. So I always approach by saying something that would make them feel important and comfortable to talk to me. Invariably, I have found that as they begin to warm up, they will ask if I'm from India. I'm not sure why it is so, but as you know, India was once part of the supercontinent called Gondwana land, which comprised of Australia, South America, Africa, and Antarctica. And when Gondwana land split up, a tectonic plate composed of India is said to have drifted north. Also, recently a 2013 study, study of indigenous Australian DNA had suggested that there was some form of migration from India to Australia about 4,000 years ago. So I'm not sure if this connection is because of our shared history. I'll give you an example. Not long ago, I was in Yulara, the resort town next to Uluru, doing a painting workshop with an Aboriginal artist. Sitting there on the sand, watching this Aboriginal artist glide her fingers through the red sand, creating waterways, fruits, trees and other symbols. I was instantaneously reminded of my time in Jaisalmer in Rajasthan. Now, the symbols of the bush tucker or native flora and fauna used by the Aboriginal people for culinary and medicinal purposes, which she was drawing, were very similar to the nutritive fruits and berries such as sangaria, kher, kumbatia, which are grown in the Thar desert and cooked into delicious dishes. Also, the colours that she was using, ochre, yellow, blue, white, it brought flashing to mind those beautifully hand-painted walls in the villages of Western Rajasthan. In fact, when my father was posted there in the early 1980s, my mother had painted the walls of our lounge in these colours. So it was quite surreal. Sitting there, I was transported back in time to my birthplace, hundreds and thousands of miles away, almost reliving my childhood. There was this connection that I felt. The, you know, the, there's there's a few things here. There's, it's a wonderful story at so many levels, but that very last sentence you said, where you said there's a connection that I felt. There was your deep unconscious bias, because don't forget the word bias does not have to be negative. It could be positive or negative. It is simply put a preference towards a person yeah. or a thing or a situation uh, against for or against a person or a thing or a situation so you met the aboriginal people in uluru you spent some time with them clearly and you mm -hmm. felt a connection you felt an instinctive implicit connection with these people that was entirely unconscious that was an unconscious bias because and you i mean you can say that now with the benefit of hindsight that you're watching them and then of course you were transported back to your growing up days and, and Rajasthan and Jaisalmer in particular mm. and the plants and the shrubs and the sand and all of these memories come flooding into your head. And that's a fabulous example of how your unconscious bias literally jump in and you looked at somebody or not one person but a few people of a different uh, 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 race than you and yet you had an unconscious implicit connection with them. That's, that's an right. example of how 
we can meet somebody in a completely different part of the world and yet without even realizing it, we have what's called an affinity bias. And you were saying as well that they reacted in a very similar fashion. They were welcoming, uh, they were inclusive, they were accepting of you with them um, and, and doing this story with them. So maybe they felt, who knows, they've probably never been to Rajasthan because they don't have the privileges that, that you have. But there was something about you that, that they felt comfortable with, which again is part of their own unconscious affinity bias. I find that fascinating and what a lovely story. I was visualizing us there, not that I've ever been to Uluru, but um, you sitting there with the Aboriginal people and, and, uh, and getting their stories. Fascinating. Thank you for that so much, Nina. So you've had the privilege of, of traveling in to so many different parts of the world and so many different uh, uh, experiences that you've had. Any any highlights that you want to share? Anything at all that, that you found particularly uh, uh, revealing or in, interesting to you? Mm, I think each country is where I've traveled is very different. And um, the people you meet, it's uh, because, I don't know, it's the journalist within me that wherever I go, it's I, I like to hear people's stories. and. So even if I'm in a rickshaw or I am in a boat, I like to talk to people and I like to know about their life stories and why they're doing what they're doing. And um, so that just enriches the entire experience of travel as well. And I've also found um, that people being very helpful in most places where like they would just, a hand would suddenly be stretched out if I'm trying to get off a boat or you know, and like especially in Italy, I I was like finding it very difficult to get off the boat in Venice, and then suddenly I had like these two men behind me, and before I knew, like I was off the boat. So people just sometimes just do it very subtly without making you feel that you were seeking help and still supporting you, and it just brings a smile to your face. How beautiful! How beautiful! So Nina, all these lovely experiences that you've had. Um, what mm -hmm. kind of, you know, what kind of top tips can you give us? What kind of learning do you take away about challenging our unconscious biases? So I'm just hoping that after these global lockdowns um, following COVID-19, once we emerge from it, that people have had this time for introspection and we can now respect humans and nature embrace the diversity around us and learn to coexist in harmony. Beautiful. Nina Pandari, thank you so very much for joining this conversation with me on the unconscious bias. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Stories of Unconscious Bias with me, Smitha Tharoor. Stay tuned for the next interview in a week's time. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter for updates on my episodes at Smitha Tharoor.